content webinar series. I'm Daniel for Alibaba's U.S. Account Management Team, and I'd like to introduce Alex and Christina from Better Life Ventures. We're happy to sit down with one of our top suppliers on Alibaba.com, who has category growth market share in the plant extract business to rank inside the top three global suppliers in this category. They sell products like essential oils, flavors, and CBD, and today they're going to share their experience and their insights with us on how to win on Alibaba.com and importantly, dispel some myths to provide the insights of what it takes to be successful on this platform. So Alex, Christina, welcome. Thank you so much, Daniel. Alex and I are so excited to be here with you today and sharing some tips and tricks and our learnings as practitioners on the platform to really help you navigate the good, the bad, and the ugly of Alibaba and being successful there. Um, so as I mentioned, Alex and I have been working on Alibaba since it's opened up its borders to the U.S. suppliers about two years ago. Um, but prior to that, we are really uh, have grown up in the, the consumer packaged goods space with nearly 40 years experience between the two of us uh, and really focused on marketing and analytics. Um, with that and growing on Alibaba, uh, the way that Alibaba was actually presented to us was uh, kind of of circ different circumstances. We launched our own brand about two years ago in this plant extract space, um, but we actually launched it as a DTC brand and focused on pure play channels. Um, and then we quickly saw this opportunity arise with Alibaba uh, when it started to, to open its doors to the Western suppliers. And we pivoted and shifted our whole go-to-market strategy so that we could become a wholesale global supplier on the platform. And after taking that initial leap of faith, we've really seen our business uh, grow um, and continue to grow every quarter since then. Um, so we're here today to really share what that looked like and what we've learned along the way with you, as well as how we've since developed this playbook to be successful on Alibaba. And it's how we are kind of playing that forward and supporting other large companies as they enter that arena and with that uncertainty so that we can help them kind of fast forward the learning phase and really get to, um, you know, those high sales and revenue that they hope to get and achieve on Alibaba. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Okay, great. And so one way in terms of how we really look at you know, developing the Alibaba business um, is really dividing into two pieces. You know, the digital marketing component is the area we focus on in order to get the buyer inquiries on the platform. Um, so that is everything we do from the keyword strategy to the product pages, et cetera. So all the digital marketing. Now on the other side, in order to gain sales, there's a whole other component of global supply chain around your pricing architecture, around, you know, what is your proposition to the competition, et cetera. So that's how we kind of look at the business and that's how we kind of frame it out and you'll get that theme in over the next few slides. If we want to go to the next slide, Christina, we'll start talking about really that good, the bad and the ugly, right? So the good is really the question that all suppliers ask, right? Which is about how, how big is this platform demand? How much traffic is there for these categories? Right, so the scale essentially, and that is what we see is the good, right? So access to the global marketplace and that large traffic is essentially the core um, of, of the Alibaba platform. We can you know, certainly attest to that given our hands-on experience in one of the larger categories. And the other interesting component is the incrementality, right? So this platform serves the whole economy essentially, right? So you will have access to small business buyers around the world and distributors that really you have not in the past, right? So this has been more of an unmeasured channel in the past and now has kind of surfaced to light. So, so that is the good, right? That's ultimately like the size of prize is there. Um, in terms of the bad, what we would call it as, look, it is gonna be continuously changing, right? It is you know, more recent that it's available to the US supplier programs. So this is relatively new in only a couple of years. So you, know, you would expect just like any technology platform you know, changes, so that is going to be something to deal with in order to be successful and, and um, really get the size of prize. The other element is really the, the user interface. Um, you know, while there's opportunities there, right, for, for uh, improvements, uh, we would say do not let that fool you in terms of the algorithm and the sophistication, right? This has over 20 years experience of trends and transactions of buyers and sellers around the world and essentially the entire economies. So what we would say is, look, that is something that to, to be flexible on and try to really stay on top of. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it, it, 
what we see is it is worth dealing with this and trying to really overcome it um, in order to uh, achieve the size of prize mentioned in the good. Now, when we say the ugly, what does that mean? And this is where Alibaba is different than most other marketplaces. It is the entire economies between countries, right? So naturally things like behaviors and trends change quite often, which results in having to constantly change your pricing architecture, maybe your, your products, et cetera. It is a high touch platform. And that is one of the most important, I think, insights we wanna emphasize is that to be successful on Alibaba, you have to define, uh, uh, create a way to, to um, uh, make sure you're resourced, that you're in there, that you're, you're looking at the platform and you're really uh, winning along the way. And that's what it really needs to be really uh, involved, right? It is not just putting it out there, but rather you have to build this into your, your plan, not necessarily just over off to the side. Um, and the last thing, which is, I don't, it's not really an ugly, but it is an ugly truth, which is for a lot of sellers, global sales and marketing is new. Like, you know, the majority of transactions that happen are within market, within the market, right? So just understanding that, you know, when you start entering global marketplaces, there is new things that you have to develop along the way. Like for instance, the buyers in other countries, you know, which countries, you know, over index in yours, um, the restrictions and the shipping um, uh, challenges of, of uh, you know, uh, shipping globally. So those are all just things you have to um, uh, you know, address as you're developing the business on Alibaba. But at the end of the day, you know, that's where you, know, you look at the good and, and the size and, and you um, kind of figure out you know, the resources you wanna put behind in order to make that happen. So now we can jump into maybe talking about myth one. Christina? Yeah, so myth one, I can manage our Alibaba account with current or shared resources. See those hands in the audience who think this is a myth or not. So I see some people saying yes, they can. But Alex and I would say no, you can't. <laughs> that would be false. So as we know, you know, Alibaba is that 24-7 online trade show. They don't sleep and neither do the multiple buyers on the platform, right? Even though in your time zone, it may be an off hour in another time zone, it's a working day. So it's really important as they are reaching out to you, they're also, uh, because it's a digital platform and the ease of use, able to reach out to you know a host of other suppliers at the same time. So you can imagine the fastest response and the most engaged response is going to be more effective at converting that inquiry into a sale. Um, that's really important on this platform um, because it's about that two-way dialogue. So, you know, one person managing all of that on their own, working and being available 24 hours to respond to buyers is not really feasible. You know, this, this is a full-time job in terms of being able to manage that, that clientele, respond to it, um, keep your, we'll talk a little bit about this in, in later slides, but being able to keep your products up to, to date and your keyword strategy strategy strong, et cetera. And as with any new sales channel, when you first start out, you know, it's oftentimes a small percentage of your total revenue and your total business. So if someone is taking this as a shared job or an additional, uh, you know, project to manage, it's probably going to get the, a smaller amount of the time that it truly deserves to be nurtured, to grow into something that is more successful. Um, so it's really important to carve out those resources to be able to handle this um, as kind of incremental to the current team. Uh, and another factor that plays here is that response times matter on the algorithm. You know, you are scored against how quickly you, you answer responses within that 24 hour period, um, which needs to be at least at that 99% mark um, to get the highest scores. Alibaba has also recently added an additional metric around the store rapid response rate. Um, and that's about responding to those inquiries in five minutes. As you can imagine, again, when they're reaching out to all these people, 24 hours is a long time to wait for a response. So being on the ball and answering that in a very prompt manner is gonna be best. And as some of you probably saw on the platform, Alibaba does offer these generic responses that can work and can be helpful, certainly if there's off hours or holiday or something, 
Um, but we would always say to follow up with that with an actual response. But in general, we would say generic responses can be a turnoff. And you know, if you think about your own customer service inquiries, when you reach out on a website or you call a company and you have those roto um, responses or these generic type of chatbots, that's definitely an off-putting situation. You already know you're not going to get the answers you want, and you're probably going to waste some time going through, um, you know, those auto-generated responses. Um, it's also not a great way to really understand who is a high-value client or customer on at the other side of that conversation. So um, we would say to kind of stay away from these. Do the best you can to offer, you know, actual live responses that can be tailored to the needs of the customer. Um, and that's the best way at really, you know, driving those inquiries into sales. Awesome. Okay. Great. So the next one uh, is an interesting myth. So Alibaba is the same as other e-commerce platforms where you must spend money to make money. Thoughts, Crowd? In fact, a little bit of both. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And it is true. It is true. So the reason is, so there is a, lot, a couple of really good reasons that you would want to invest in paid advertising. One is that it does drive your organic, your non-paid. In other words, if you do infuse some um, uh, investment behind uh, keyword advertising, um, later there will be benefits to uh, your organic, right? The folks that will just come on, not based on your advertising. Um, the second reason is if you want to go to be like a five-star uh, supplier, it is part of the metric. So the algorithm does uh, kind of account for this as your scale metric to say you, there's a certain amount of cut through uh, in the marketplace so you can have by in have investing in KWA. And, and that's really why ultimately why most sellers uh, do uh, invest quite a lot around, you know, your keyword campaigns as, as well as showcases because it drives scale and reach. So ultimately, if you have a proposition that's strong and, and the more wholesale buyers you can get this in front of, um, that you'll convert people, then you know this is that tool to help get you in your proposition in front of large scale audiences. Okay. All right, myth three. I can use my current supply chain to be successful on Alibaba. Looks like we have a few that believe that's true. This is actually a quick, quick trick question because it depends, but we would also say usually not in, in the companies we've come across anyway. Um, you know, it's really about being set up to optimally, optimally service the you know, global demand that you're gonna see. And many times you'll need to adopt your proposition and adjust your go-to-market strategy to serve that. Um, so, you know, we can speak to this as practitioners. We had our own brand when we started, and that's what we launched on the platform initially because we, we had all this inventory of branded products. And what we quickly saw is that, as Alex mentioned, you know, many of the buyers on the platform are those small businesses. So they're really looking to <clears throat> buy the products and then put their own label on it, or they're resellers themselves of the products that are selling to an end consumer or another supplier that also wants to do that. Um, so they're not really looking to resell your branded products, which they probably have, you know, little familiarity with, but rather build their own brands from there. Um, so we had to change, you know, our go to market strategy and really focus on the ingredients, um, you know, and, and the bulk ingredients there uh, instead of the final, the finished goods. Uh, we also have to think how competitive is that proposition in the global market space. So this may be your first entrance into the global marketplace versus selling domestically, where all different rules apply. Uh, you know, the price value equation is going to be very different because of the competitors that you're now competing with. So it's really important to adjust that and think about what your unique selling proposition is going to be. Uh, and then the third is really, is your product ready to ship? We know that there are many buyers out there that look for custom products and having, you know, um, a white label program is, is very important and, and could be uh, really prosperous, but it's also 
a, a big selling proposition to have products that the customer doesn't have to wait for. There's not a long lead time and you're able to ship right off the shelf. It's also what fuels Alipay on the platform. Uh, so it's really important to have those products in stock and ready to sell and use that also as a differentiator on the platform. And we do have a question from the crowd here. This one comes from John. He asked for any advice for local distributors for worldwide. Are there any good resources? And also a friendly reminder to the chat, the Q&A function is below or above on your toolbar. You can ask questions as you like, and myself and the panelists will stop and ask what you uh, ask what you, or answer what you've asked. So uh, just a friendly reminder there. Yeah, so um, in terms of resources, uh, you know, I think one thing that we found is sometimes you can find, you may have to develop more points of distribution to service those markets and be available in their markets so that you can get products to them quicker, right? So ready to ship, but then you may have a really long line getting the products to them. Um, so it's, you may have to establish and expand your distribution centers in some key markets where you're finding there's a lot of customer demand. And that can grow organically out of the customers that you are able to gain on the Alibaba, Alibaba platform. If I can build on top of that too, there's, I mean, essentially the, you're asking for, you know, how do you get the high value, right? Because distributors are high value, right? They're going to buy more quantities, more frequent. Um, and that's also where your scores come in, you know, uh, handy where, you know, as you develop your supplier account, as you increase your rankings, you get more exposed to the high value buyers. So think of it as like the lower your quality score, you don't get the quality buyers reaching out. Um, you get them once you start showing up and key, you know, very critical keywords, when you have enough scalability, um, you know, they're usually pretty savvy. So they understand ready to ship and operational efficiencies. Like is this supplier, can, you, can they ship out quantities uh, quickly? Um, you know, so they're high value and, and the way to really find them best Distributors is really to build your account and, and making sure, as Christina mentioned earlier, that you're vetting them through that, you know, inquiries that, you know, you're doing some research and whatever information they're providing you. And, and that's how you're able to capture that, you know, hey, this is a distributor. They have a, a website that they told me in their chat, um, you know, maybe some MOQs. So, so that's actually another way just to build towards, you know, uh, finding distributor buyers. Hmm, there's a follow-up question here in the chat that kind of builds off this. It says, well, how do I turn a buyer into a frequent customer? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's really about that whole lifetime value equation, right? That's so important. Um, and I think there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, one is to obviously establish that relationship with them and have good follow-through. So being prompt in terms of the information they're seeking, um, really seeking to understand their business model. So how are they selling through what channels? What's their product expansion look like? What's the demand in their market, et cetera. So you become more of that partner to them to help you know, feed them new samples, new product ideas, et cetera, to grow their business as well as they grow, you grow. Um, and then also it's really about that follow-up. Right. So anticipating, you know, you sent them an order on this day that they should be running low in about three to four weeks. So you're going to um, make sure you're proactive and following up with them, you know, bringing new products to them, new innovation, any um, new news around promotions, et cetera, um, supply chain, you know, capacity, et cetera. So making sure that you keep them informed and you keep them set up for success with their customers because the more happy their customers are, the more happy they're going to be and uh, the more happy we're going to be. Great answer. All right, go to the next myth then. That's okay. four. So I'll talk about this one. So and we hear this a lot. Uh, I don't need to spend that much time on product pages. I just need to get them out there and published. Um, so what does everybody think? Okay, so this is also mostly, I think that's what people think. So a lot of people think it's true. False, actually. So this is one of my favorite sections that we talk about because it is the core of the business. It's the product pages. So knowing that your product pages drive the algorithm and the algorithm drives the customer inquiries, um, it is really important to know that the more energy and resources you put around creating your, the best products you can, the better your scores. And then everything comes, like we talked earlier, like the high value distributors. 
Um, here's a few kind of quick ways that, you know, we find our gaps currently with a lot of suppliers that you can do here and now and, and start getting more, more inquiries. And one is making sure the product pages all have professional art and creative. Right, so you know the following the Alibaba standards, the white background, have it professionally taken. Um, there's value in that, right? A lot of buyers go through it. There's a lot of traffic, like we had mentioned at the beginning. Um, so you want to capture those clicks and then those those customers with good art. Um, the second piece is more analytics driven, and that's really about knowing the keywords that you participate in. So what are people in your category typing, right? And, and the more insight you can find that. Um, through the platform analytics, uh, through more exploration of yourself, um, you, know, you can identify then those keywords and put them in your product pages so that it's connected to what people are looking for. So that's another way to build the algorithm uh, out of the product pages. Now, the third piece is the one that we see probably least leveraged, and that is really filling in the, all the other information. So there is quite a lot there in terms of capacity, factory pictures, and what we can say is, buyers globally like those sections. So it is very important to fill them all out, provide it with as much transparency as you can about your company and your products. Um, and, and it answers a lot of questions, results in more clicks, et cetera. So ultimately it's that better engagement leads to better clicks, scores, ultimately is kind of the formula for, for driving best product pages. But again, yes, quantity is important, but develop as much as you can based on what you're able to uh, maintenance ongoing. So that's a very important piece where we want to also emphasize where look, you want to make them great and you want to certainly make as many product variations as you can. However, you also need to optimize them ongoing. So that would mean things like, you know, your keywords that may change period to period, right? So what's hot to steer in your category uh, maybe wasn't last year when you built your product pages. So starting to infuse better keywords. Uh, you know, things like changes in your, your uh, company, if there's more capacity, if, if, you know, your company grew, those are all things that actually benefit the product pages. So updating and refreshing the product pages is actually critical with gaining traction with the algorithm. And I, and I think what a lot of our customers seem to forget is um, pricing changes too, right? Your pricing is not always the same, your MOQs, your sampling. Um, and that's really a distinguisher too, because a lot there's a lot of price equations at first glance that happen when supply, when buyers are reaching out to multiple suppliers. We have an anonymous question here from the chat. What would you recommend to a seller who only has five unique products? Right. That's a great question. <laughs> Alex, did you want to take it? Um, sure. I mean, with that, you have to, it goes back to a lot of times the keywords and really the variations of your products. So they may be five uh, products. You may have multiple flavors. You may have some that are ready to ship, some that are customizable. Um, and, and you can be really creative with, with the key terms with things like private label, bulk, wholesale. There is a, quite a lot of keywords that can create more variations. Um, but obviously, you know, they have to stay close and true to what the product is, right? But essentially, it doesn't have to be five product pages. It could be hundreds. Right, if you are playing in a bigger category, which has more keywords. Hmm. Good answer. And here's a follow-up question, also anonymous. Uh, how important is it to reply to inquiries that are not related to my product? Yeah, it's so there's there's two of those, right? There's one that would fall in that spam category of someone that's maybe just you know um, doing something wrong on the platform or reaching out to you about something that may not be legal, etc. And or trying to sell you a service, right? And those you have the ability on Alibaba to mark those as spam so they don't get counted against your response rate. Um, but for all other inquiries and people asking questions or seeking to understand something, even if it's not necessarily tied to your core portfolio or going to drive a sale, we would say you should still respond to them in a timely manner. Obviously, your investment of time in those should be minimal. Um, you should be focusing on the high value. Um, but essentially, you should be responding to every inquiry outside of the spams that you mark so that you are not dinged on Alibaba for that. Perfect answer. That is exactly what we need our sellers to do. And here's a more category specific question for the, the experts here. Uh, Beth asks, how do you work with buyers who are in markets where CBD is not allowed? Yeah, I mean, we don't service those buyers, right? So this is where it's important to know the markets that, you know, you can grow your business in. Um, we essentially, for those buyers, we just, we do respond to all buyers. 
in, in a nice way and just let them know, you know, we do not ship to their market. Um, and that's it. So we do encourage to respond because it is part of the score in the algorithm. However, you do not need to, uh, you know, service every customer that asks for, right? So that's up to you as a business to make sure you're selecting, you know, the qualified uh, uh, buyers from markets where, you know, you have the ability to sell. Absolutely. That clears that up, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. So our last myth, uh, Alibaba seems like a great opportunity to invest and really expand my business. Hands up. Daniel, Daniel, hands up. I see a lot of hands up. And, and of course, you, we've seen that success there. And we would absolutely say that's true. But it may not be the right opportunity for you. And, you know, you obviously want to be set up for success on the platform. And I think everything we've touched on in the other myths, right, all those watch outs, the, the tips, the tricks, those are all important as you enter this platform um, to set yourself up for success. You know, just really understanding that size of the category. Is it too small? Is it overly saturated with global suppliers? What is that competitive landscape? look like? How are you going to stand out in a crowded market? How do you really sharpen your proposition? What's your unique selling proposition between that in that value equation? Um, you know, you, there's a lot more competition now with other, you know, suppliers being allowed on the platform. So what's that size of competitors and how fast do they ship? What's their portfolio look like? How can you carve out your niche within that, that space? Um, and you may fall short in some of these and that's okay. You don't need an answer for everything day one, but you definitely wanna be ready because as Alex started out by saying, the demand is there, right? The inquiries are there. So um, I think what we've found and, you know, we, we took a few years and did a lot of tests and learns and, and had, to sh had to show the proof of concept. Um, but what we're essentially offering is uh, skipping that ramp up period, right? So that you can immediately start seeing kind of the fruits of your labor on the, on the platform and benefiting from that algorithm by understanding kind of the inner workings and the playbook of how to be successful. Um, so I think as long as you kind of go in eyes wide open, really understand what that good, bad, and ugly looks like, um, obviously have taken the steps to set yourself up for success to be able to properly service it, um, have that you know, you, uh, niche carved out for yourself, how you're gonna differentiate, how do you want to really communicate your proposition to buyers, et cetera, then it's absolutely a good opportunity. You know, the inquiries are there, the demand is there. It's easy to facilitate sales with on the, within the platform. Um, so we would definitely say uh, it's a great opportunity and we've seen the ROI. Absolutely love to hear that. And, and a question from the chat here, again, anonymous, is it fair to compare Alibaba and Amazon? What do you guys think? Very different platforms. Uh, you know, uh, one is direct to consumer, obviously we know one is wholesale and that in itself creates differences in them. You know, one is about more frequency, you know, higher um, volume of purchases and transactions, but smaller units. Um, so, it's, and then the other one is longer lead times to get to those sales, but essentially getting to those higher value buyers that are going to continue to buy from you reoccurring. Um, I would say the big, the big differences are really Amazon's a one-way conversation. You're putting out your PDPs, which is very similar to Alibaba. You both PDPs are very important. That's, you know, how your product shows up. That's your kind of your billboard. And, you know, search is obviously important too. your visibility on the platform, your points of distribution. Other than that, very different. One-way conversation on Amazon where you're putting those products up and then sellers, buyers are coming to you to buy. On Alibaba, it's a two-way conversation. It's a partnership. You are really having to provide that information. Again, going back to it being high touch, you're needing to be in the platform service it to continue to get those high scores within the algorithm. Um, so it's not a set it and forget it. Uh, you know, Amazon would say you need unique product pages and it's more about the quality versus the quantity where on Alibaba it's about both the quality and the quantity. Um, so there's definitely some big differences, but, you know, for sure, a lot of reward in Alibaba as well. Great. Uh, here's a, here's a follow-up question to this is how do you deal with the expectation level? Um, you know, when it's, when it stands with Alibaba versus Amazon, right. In terms of high sales. Um, you know, how do you, how do you manage those expectations? 
Yeah. So one thing I think is just being clear on those, what those sales expectations are. Um, you, you do have a longer lead time on Alibaba, right? You need to build that sales pipeline because a sample order today in a month could be a first, you know, large order leading to a reoccurring customer that's ordering from you monthly with higher and higher quantities. Um, but that sales pipeline doesn't get built overnight and it's not going to happen on day one. You know, you have to have those conversations. You have to um, nourish those relationships. You have to really understand the customer and what they're trying to build, give samples potentially, work with them. And then all of a sudden you have all these sales that are starting to reoccur at the same time. So you have that, you know, your pipeline is kind of paying off. So I think you need some patience up front as you build that momentum and as you get smarter on the algorithm um, versus, you know, having that immediate sale that's coming in every day. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. And, and of course, uh, another question on this topic is someone asked, well, how long did it take you guys to get your first sale? Was that an international or a domestic customer? You know, maybe you can tell us that story. I may know it, but uh, the audience does. So um, we'd love to hear your story. I mean, we did get our first sale in the first month, absolutely. Um, but it is a ramp up. It's, it's like Christina said, you know, it, it is about identifying high value, getting them and developing them to be, in many cases, high value. So for instance, we, we start customers off as being maybe, you know, their business is smaller, but as you know, you have strong proposition, their businesses grow, and then they buy more from you. So that lifetime value becomes very important. Um, so, you know, that, that's how we're looking at it is, is wholesale is about lifetime value. Um, and it is all about that, that um, you know, the high value buyer, of which just takes time. Right, it, it will take time, but as Christina mentioned, it does accumulate as you build that Rolodex of customers that are distributors. It really is not that different from, you know, the brick and mortar market, right? Like high value distributors at the end of the day will do more research around their suppliers, right? Um, they will be a little harder to, to get, right? Because they, you know, they don't necessarily make it easy, but they do go and, and look across many buyers. So absolutely, that's how we would look at it, Daniel. I uh, hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think that's very clear. And, um, you know, I can remember that from the beginning of when you guys got started. So tell that story. Great. Well, that's the end of our myth busting section for today. We hope you learned something new, whether you're a new supplier considering being it or you've been on the platform a while. Um, again, we're Better Life Ventures. Please feel free to reach out to Alex or myself, Christina. Our website is here, our contact information. I know Daniel will be sending this out after it. And we're really looking forward to continuing this webinar series with Alibaba. So we'll be coming back October 14th. We hope we see many of you there again. Um, in the, that session, we're gonna pick one of these topics and really dive into it and give you some, even some more tips and tricks. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. I don't know if there's other questions that we can answer. Give the chat a minute here, but uh, in the meantime, of course, like Christina mentioned, this is part of an Alibaba content series. That's where we post it on Alibaba's Seller Success Hub. Uh, in addition, to being emailed out to everybody. Um, you know, obviously Christina are two of my favorite people to work with, so they definitely would like to hear from you and have a lot of great knowledge to uh, to pass off to our our seller base. So, um, you know, we look forward to seeing them again, and they are certainly around to answer any more questions. So. Looks like the chat is quiet for now. So on that note, thanks for joining us. Alice, uh, Christina, pleasure as always. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for the Thank you very much, all. Thank, much Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Perfect.